why don't Buddhists believe in God? When it comes to religion, at least in the West, God sort of plays the central role. Atheism is seen as sort of a term of denigration. It may even mean something like non-religious or anti-religious even. So how can Buddhists be not believing in God? Well, to begin with, there are, as I've said in past videos, many forms of Buddhism, many Buddhisms. There are also many conceptions of God, so we have to be a little careful here. In one way of seeing it, all traditional forms of Buddhism accept the existence of gods. But in another way of seeing it, Buddhism is essentially an atheistic religion. How do we deal with this apparent paradox? That's going to be the subject of today's video. Now, to make things simpler, I'm going to focus on the teachings of Gotama, the Sakyan sage, that is the historical Buddha, insofar as we can reconstruct what he might have said about such things. And the Buddha certainly accepted the existence of what are known as devas, devas who were worshipped by the Vedic practitioners of his day. These were beings of uh, supernatural beings of great power. The, the word deva is actually cognate to the English words such as divine and deity. Basically, they were gods. But the Buddha's view of these deities was non-traditional. For example, the Vedic practitioners of his day accepted the deity Brahma as the creator of the universe and as the deity most associated with the knowledge of the sacred texts, those Vedas that I mentioned. However, in the Buddha's telling, Brahma didn't create anything and was fundamentally ignorant. For example, in one early sutta, the Buddha gives his picture of cosmology, of the apparently beginningless round of universes that were created and destroyed over the eons. And in the most recent one of these, the universe was created, the first being to arise within it existed for a time alone, and was lonely, became lonely and wished for companionship. This being had been created out of its own karma into that universe. Then other beings were created in that universe out of their own past karma, and they came to exist in that universe. However, this first being, who was created when nothing else existed in that universe, believed that he had somehow created all of these other beings, that his desire, his wish, his loneliness itself had brought these other beings into existence. Now, the being who was reborn there first thinks, I am Brahma, the great Brahma, the vanquisher, the unvanquished, the universal seer, the wielder of power, God Almighty, the maker, the creator, the first, the begetter, the controller, the father of those who have been born and those yet to be born. These beings were created by me. Why is that? Because first I thought, oh, if only other beings would come to this place. Such was my heart's wish, and then these creatures came to this place. And then those other beings who had been created after Brahma in this universe also agreed with him. They took him to be their creator, simply because he had been there first. And so, in other words, they believed in Brahma's own delusion. And this, according to the Buddha, was the true origin of Brahma, the true origin of his delusions about being God Almighty, the creator of all things, and, and so powerful and all the rest, simply because he had been first created into this universe. In the background of this picture of the Buddhas is this is, is an idea that all of these beings were essentially mortal, that they were born through their karma, that they would eventually pass away due to their karma. While they might live an enormously long amount of time, compared with humans, for example, nevertheless they were still mortals. In another early sutta, the Buddha satirizes Brahman in a different way. In this sutta, there is a monk who wants to know the answer to a difficult conundrum, where the four great elements of earth, air, fire, and water disappear. 
Now, the answer to this conundrum isn't, isn't something that really needs to worry us, at least to, to the, to the, for this story. Uh, it has to do with uh, deep states of meditative attainment, the idea being that somebody who has deep knowledge of these states of, of, of these meditative states would know the answer to this question, but, but people who don't have this kind of uh, deep attainment are not going to know the answer. But again, that's not really relevant to the point that's being made in this satire. This monk, nevertheless, he, he goes up to the, to the lower heavens and asks the gods there, where do the four elements disappear? And the gods don't know the answer to that question. And so they suggest that he go up the hierarchy of deities to the next higher level and ask them. And so the story goes that this monk spent quite a while going from one uh, realm of gods to the next, up and up and up, through higher and higher gods and higher and higher deities, asking the same question and always getting the answer that they didn't know. Finally, the monk gets to the top level. That is to say, the, the, the deities on one level tell him to go and ask Brahma himself. And so he asks, Reverend Brahma, that is, where do these four principal states cease without anything left over, namely the elements of earth, water, fire, and air? Brahma said to him, I am Brahma, the great Brahma, the vanquisher, the unvanquished, the universal seer, the wielder of power, God Almighty, the maker, the creator, the first, the begetter, the controller, the father of those who have been born and those yet to be born. And we will note that that was exactly the same thing that Brahma said in the other sutta. That's this kind of lion's roar of Brahma about how great he is. Now the monk is somewhat taken aback by this utterance of Brahma, and he says to Brahma that, I wasn't asking who you were, I wasn't asking if you were God Almighty and all that. All I wanted to know about is where these, you know, four states disappeared. And Brahma gives the same answer. You know, I am Brahma, the Lord of everything, and so on. And again, the monk says, that's fine, but I didn't want to know that, that answer. I'm asking a different question. And this goes three times. Now, within the early texts, there is a kind of a trope that if you ask somebody something three times, they have to give you a straight answer. And so after the third time, what happens? Then the great Brahma took that mendicant by the arm, led him off to one side, and said to him, we might say in a low voice, Mendicant, these gods think that there's nothing at all that I don't know and see and understand and realize. That's why I didn't answer in front of them. But I too do not know where these four principal states cease with nothing left over. And then Brahma suggests that the monk go and ask the Buddha, who would probably know more than he does. And we can see this is a broad satire of Brahma. While the, the Vedic uh, uh, worshippers would have considered him the creation of all things and the greatest knower of the ancient Vedas, for the Buddha, he was basically a vain and ignorant blowhard. Somebody who has to take you aside to tell you the truth because he doesn't want to look bad in front of the other gods for being ignorant, even though he pretends to know so much. So it, we also see from this story that for the Buddha, the Buddha is the one who has the knowledge and the, the gods are very much on a second plane. They don't understand or know as much as he does. For this reason, in the early texts, the Buddha is known as the teacher of gods and men. That is to say, he taught both humans and deities. We can go further than this, however, and note that within the early texts, it wasn't simply that the Buddha didn't believe that Brahma was the creator of all things and knowledgeable and all the rest, but also the Buddha didn't think it was skillful for us to believe in a creator deity. In another early sutta, the Buddha discusses this. He says that there are other ascetics and Brahmins who hold such a doctrine and view as this. Whatever this person experiences, whether pleasure, pain, or neither pain nor pleasure, all that is caused by God's creative activity. The Buddha then responds that such people would then believe that it was due to God's creative activity that they would misbehave, that they might steal or kill or lie to one another. And then, the Buddha says, 
that people such as these would have no desire to do what should be done and to avoid doing what should not be done, nor do they make an effort in this respect, since they do not apprehend as true and valid anything that should be done or should not be done, they are muddle-minded, they do not guard themselves, and even the personal designation ascetic could not legitimately be applied to them. In other words, the Buddha seems to have argued that belief in a creator deity like this puts moral responsibility for our actions into the hands of the deity himself, making us into moral puppets. We wouldn't have, then, any responsibility, in which case, what's the point of, of practice? That we, we, there would be no point to practice because the deity would have been the one responsible, not us personally. Also, for similar reasons, the Buddha didn't think that prayer to the deities was particularly useful either. He argues that the things that we want are not got by praying or wishing for them. If they were, who would lack them? So what we see here is a worldview, a cosmology within early Buddhism that definitely accepts the existence of these devas, these divine beings, divinities. However, that pictures these divinities, describes them in ways that are radically distinct from any kind of Western theological conception of God. These divinities, these devas, are not all-knowing, they're not all-powerful, they're not all good, and they're not even immortal. So to that extent, from a theological conception, we can see that early Buddhism is basically an atheistic understanding, or at least a, a non-theistic understanding of the world. We could also see it maybe as being agnostic in the sense of not knowing whether there is a supreme deity, but only in the sense that we literally don't know. Because for the Buddha, if there were such a deity, they would not be of any particular religious or spiritual importance. Certainly the Buddha did not feel that his own path towards enlightenment required knowledge of or belief in any such deity. Now, what I've been discussing up until now is the picture we find in early Buddhism. To an extent, this same picture is shared by all forms of Buddhism, but also, to a very important extent, later forms of Buddhism became much more comfortable with the metaphors of theism and de deities and gods, uh, and even a true god, than we find in this picture of early Buddhism. In particular, in later forms of Buddhism, such as the Pure Land, we find devotion to and prayer to uh, deified Buddhists or Buddhas, such as Amitabha, being the focus of practice. However, we have to be very careful in interpreting such practices because their interpretation is not necessarily straightforward. They can be, and often are, interpreted in terms of the non-duality of all things and the emptiness of all phenomena. And to that extent, a deified Buddha is themselves empty, is themselves non-dual. And this collapses the normal, our normal concepts such as that, those of existence and non-existence. Indeed, even collapses any duality we might have between theism and atheism. And so we might say, that the existence of such Buddhas is beyond existence and non-existence. Such uh, uh, descriptors don't really apply to them, don't really apply to this Dharma at its most basic level, and so is sort of beyond our concepts of existence, non-existence, theism, atheism, and so on. And so to that extent, in trying to interpret such uh, uh, advanced dharmas, such as those found in Pure Land and other later forms of Buddhism, is, as I say, difficult and has to be undertaken with some care. Now, I did an earlier video as well, or a couple of earlier videos actually, on the kind of down-to-earth picture that we find in the Buddha's own teaching. It's relevant to what I've been discussing in today's video. I'll leave a link to one of those up here on the screen if you haven't seen it or would like to see it again. If you're getting something out of what I'm discussing here, uh, consider taking a look at my Patreon page, which is linked here on the screen and down below in the notes, and see if you want to help join us and support the work.
Thanks so much, and we'll catch you on the next video. And meanwhile, all of you, be well.